Welcome everybody to Felix Mendelssohn Part 2. So last time we were talking about Mendelssohn's piano and orchestral music. Today we're going to focus on his concertos and his oratorios, in particular the very famous violin concerto in E minor, one of the best known and most frequently performed violin concertos ever written, and his final oratorio, Elijah, which is without question one of the great choral works ever written. So last time we were talking about Mendelssohn's association through the family connections that he had with many of the great writers and poets and playwrights of his time. But he, of course, also was exposed to many of the great musicians of his era. And it would be an acquaintance and eventually a friendship with a violinist named Ferdinand David that would inspire him to compose the E minor violin concerto. David was concert master in a wonderful orchestra that Men Mendelssohn was one of the founders of in the city of Leipzig, known as the Gewandhaus Orchestra. It is to this day one of the world's best known orchestras and Mendelssohn served as his music director for several years. And David was the concert master, the, the person sitting in the uh, first chair seat of the first violins. And so Mendelssohn had been talking to David for several years about the possibility of writing an extensive work for him. And eventually that happened, the Violin Concerto from 1844. Uh, David assisted Mendelssohn in the composition of the work and provided some technical advice in terms of what was possible on the violin of that era. And then, of course, premiered it with Mendelssohn conducting. Uh, the work is so famous that we forget, in, in many cases, how innovative it was. And, and as I've um, highlighted a few times in these videos on Mendelssohn, you know, we have this view of him as being this very conservative, traditional composer, and in some ways he was. But he was also someone who was, was pushing the boundaries, maybe um, not as overtly, as someone like like Berlioz did, but that doesn't mean that that Mendelssohn didn't do things that were that were really were um, very progressive. And so one of them was the simple key of the, this piece. E minor was not a common key for violin concertos. Uh, all of the great violin concertos, aside from the Mendelssohn that we associate with the 19th century, are in the key of D major. So think of Beethoven, think of Tchaikovsky, and think of Johannes Brahms. So E minor is a bit unusual, and it's often, you know, been considered a, a pretty dramatic, um, intense key. And so I think Mendelssohn was really trying to get something across by writing it in that key. Uh, another innovative factor is the, the fact that this work, although it's in the traditional three movements, fast, slow, fast design, the movements are performed ataka. And we talked about that in a, a previous video when we were looking at works like the Beethoven Fifth Symphony, where you have one movement that um, continues into the next without pause. So Mendelssohn writes, the in the case of the, the um, shifting from the first to the second movement, there's actually only a single note in solo bassoon that serves as the link. Between movements two and three, he actually has a, uh, an introduction to movement three, which serves as the bridge. But the fact that all three movements are supposed to be performed as a unit is an indication that Mendelssohn was really thinking of this concerto in a very romantic sense, meaning that he wanted it to be heard as a complete artistic statement, not just a collection of individual movements. Related to that is also the key scheme that Mendelssohn chose for this concerto. So first movement in, in E minor, in the classical sense, we would probably expect the second movement to be in the relative major of G major, but instead he doesn't do that. He goes down a major third for the tonic to C major. And then the final movement, he goes to the parallel major of the tonic key, which is E major. So that's not entirely unusual, but especially using that, that uh, C major for the second movement was a bit unusual. When we look a little bit more closely at the overall form, and we're going to concentrate just on the first movement, although I would, would ask you to listen to the entire concerto, um, the, the first movement can be described as a modified sonata form. So as we talked about in the video about uh, Mozart's concertos in the classical period, and even into the, the concertos of Beethoven, 
the opening movement would typically begin with what is what is sometimes called double exposition form. So you'll have an exposition for the orchestra that presents a lot of the main thematic material, and then you'll have that doesn't modulate, that stays pretty much in the tonic. And then you'll have a second exposition for the soloist that will bring perhaps some new melodic material in, but most importantly will achieve a modulation since most concertos are in major keys, that means they'll modulate to uh, the dominant. But Mendelssohn dispenses with that double exposition idea. Instead, after about a measure and a half of um, accompaniment figures, really, in the orchestra, the, the soloist begins right away with the main theme. And so it's as if Mendelssohn is saying, I want to throw off some of those traditional expected elements of the opening of a concerto and move right into the the main thematic idea. And so I wanted to uh, play just a little bit of the opening of the concerto and you will you'll hear how he um, achieves that. And you'll also hear the the beauty and the lyricism, which is such a hallmark of so many of Mendelssohn's pieces. but he wrote he wrote the um, the choice of pitch content for the soloist is in a very high, very singing, very beautiful, resonant part of the, of the violin and really shows off the beauty of that instrument. This version is played by the wonderful Russian violinist Maxim Vengerov. takes up the theme. Another innovative aspect of this concerto is what Mendelssohn does closer to the end of the concerto. So in a typical, say, Mozart concerto or Haydn or Beethoven concerto, you would have a return of the, the main um, musical ideas at the end. So what we call the recapitulation in sonata form, right? And then shortly before the closing of the movement, the soloist will perform a cadenza. So that's what we would would be the standard um, the standard structure. Mendelssohn um, plays around with that a bit, and actually inserts the cadenza right before the recapitulation. So it's in a in a scrambled order from what we would normally expect. And rather than expecting the soloist to completely improvise the cadenza, Mendelssohn actually writes it out, and he he got a lot of advice from David about how to write this cadenza and what would work on the violin. And so I want to play just a little bit of the concluding section of the cadenza, followed by the recapitulation, where you'll actually hear the first theme played in the orchestra rather than with the soloist. Thank you. 
So you get a sense, even from those short passages, of the Mendelssohnian chamber music texture that he became uh, so well known for. And and even though, you know, this is a concerto and obviously the, the violinist is front and center, there are moments like we see in the recapitulation where the violinist becomes the accompanist and the orchestra takes the lead. And, and so that is is something that we certainly see going back to, to Mozart um, and to a slightly lesser extent Beethoven. But Mendelssohn, I think, really, um, really encourages that in this concerto. So I hope that you will take the time to listen to the entire work. There's a, a this is a, a piece that is a front and center in the repertory of great violinists all over the world. And there are a lot of reasons for that, why it continues to maintain its popularity um, more than a century and a half after its premiere. And finally, I want to talk about Mendelssohn's choral music. So Mendelssohn, again, growing up in that environment in, in Leipzig, um, had the opportunity to be exposed to a lot of choral music and also to do some conducting of choral music. He was very passionate about Bach, and as a matter of fact, in 1829, Mendelssohn conducted an abbreviated version of uh, Bach's great St. Matthew Passion and had been sort of uh, exposed to Bach's music by his friend Ferdinand David. And so this, uh, this rediscovery of Bach's music has become known as the Bach Renaissance. And Mendelssohn had a lot to do with um, reviving interest in the music of Bach. So in addition to smaller choral pieces, Bach, um, Mendelssohn's most famous choral works are his two great oratorios, St. Paul and Elijah. And we're going to focus on Elijah, which is actually the final Mendelssohn work that was, that was put into print. Elijah is based on some episodes from the Old Testament, in particular the Book of Kings. So OT stands for Old Testament. And it just like in the oratorios of Handel and Haydn, uh, it includes, of course, a very prominent role for the chorus and several solo parts. Um, Haydn was... Uh, Mendelssohn was commissioned to write Elijah by the Triennial Festival in the uh, English city of Birmingham, where he had visited on a couple of occasions. And they had a, a very strong choral tradition. So that's in central England. And, and so there was a lot, of, a lot of interest in bringing together people for community choral singing, which is something that we certainly have uh, in the United States, we have choral societies, and most universities have community choruses and so forth, including right here where I live. And, and so Mendelssohn wrote a work that would be both appealing to listeners, but also singable for uh, singers who might not be trained professional singers, but wanted to have the opportunity to perform. And so this work gives them lots of great choruses from which to choose in the same way that Handel does in Messiah or Haydn does in the creation. We're going to focus on the final chorus called And Then Shall Your Light. But in this final chorus, just a couple of things to listen for. The influence of Bach. So again, having studied St. Matthew Passion and other choral pieces of Bach, Mendelssohn was very influenced by that. The influence of Handel and also the influence of Haydn. A lot of, of this work, both in the uh, selection we're going to listen to and in the other movements from Elijah, alternate between homophonic music, meaning block chords where everyone's singing the same thing at the same time, and polyphonic music. So fugal music, where you have a main musical idea in one part that is answered by the other parts. Uh, this is a big sound, and this is actually one of the larger orchestral ensembles that, that Mendelssohn wrote for, and one suspects that if Mendelssohn had lived a little bit longer, say uh, well into his 40s, he might have done some more, even further experimentation with expanding the orchestra from what he had done in his symphonies. But, um, but it's a big sound, and I think you're going to hear at the beginning the text, um, and then shall your light break forth like the light of morning breaketh. You'll really be able to hear him paint that text. And so we'll listen to that, and then we'll listen to a little bit of the second section. So the work is roughly in two main sections. Uh, the second section, which is the more uh, polyphonic section, the text is 
Lord, our creator, how excellent thy name is in all the nations. So here is the opening of the final chorus from Mendelssohn's glorious oratorio, Elijah. <laughs> All right, and then the tenors finish off the the uh, fugal subject presentation in all four parts. At the end of the, the movement, uh, it returns to uh, homophony and closes in a, a brilliant, glorious sound that is very reminiscent of works like the end of the Hallelujah Chorus or the final chorus from Handel's Messiah. So I hope that you will, will take the time to listen not only to this great final chorus, but the entire oratorio. He uses a baritone or bass baritone to play uh, the Old Testament prophet Elijah. And so it has a very dramatic sense to it, uh, very much like we see in the, the great dramatic oratorios of, of Handel, like Solomon and Saul and so forth, where he's really using these, these individual characters um, almost like in an opera, even though the work, just like in all oratorios is not staged or costumed. And so uh, that concludes our, our discussion of Mendelssohn. So I hope that these two videos on this great composer have been informative. And thank you for your attention.